It's been rightly said that if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible. If you'd like to hear Him speak audibly, read your Bible out loud. Through the Word of God, the God of the universe speaks. That last line in that song uh, is one that should bring sobriety to what we come to do week by week. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built, inferring that it is through God speaking through His Word that the church is built. Now, you may think, well, I'm just a Sunday school teacher. I just teach preschoolers. I just help out in kids' church. I just teach teenagers. I'm just leading a Bible study. I'm just helping out with growth group. But friends, every time the Word of God is spoken, we have unleashed the means by which God builds His church. Do you believe that? Because if we believe it, then we won't just think, oh yeah, I just need to teach a Bible study. We'll actually think about it. It'll actually cause us to be quite thoughtful about what we say and what we do and how we approach the Bible. And it does affect how we approach the Bible because then all of a sudden I want to approach the Bible so that my words aren't the words that are being heard here. I want to approach the Bible and teach the Bible in such a way that what reverberates in our minds are the words of God because that's what builds, that's what edifies, that's what has the power to penetrate and get between heart and soul, joint and marrow. And that's what we come to do now. If you'll take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5, we'll continue our journey through not just the Beatitudes, but the entire Sermon on the Mount. We won't take the whole sermon one verse at a, the whole sermon one verse at a time. Uh, we're just taking the Beatitudes one at a time, but we will read from verse 2 of chapter 5 to verse 12. If you're not familiar with the Bible and you're going to use one that's in the pew in front of you, Matthew 5 is on page 809 of that Bible. This is what the Spirit says. And Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the pure, poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Our Father, test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled 
with your glory. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> Golf is one of those games that toys with my emotions. On one day, it can make me feel very glad. I can be quite delighted. And on another day, it can be quite a downer. There are some days that I think I might be getting the hang of it, and there are other days that I'm reminded that the word golf spelled backwards is flog. If that's a word you're unfamiliar with, to flog means to beat and to torture. Now, several years ago when we were living in Nashville, I was in one of those flogging seasons with my golf game. Nothing was going right, and I had sympathy for those men who had taken their entire set of clubs and thrown them into the lake and left and never gone back. And I was at the dentist one day, and I was thumbing through what are never current issues of whatever magazines are there, and I pick up some issue of Golf Digest, and I see on the cover that inside there's an article called Getting Back to the Basics or something like that. So I start to read it, <clears throat> and it focuses on three things to get right that are important to get right. Three things before you ever swing the club, your posture, your grip, and your aim. So I studied the diagrams, I read the instructions, and I did some self-examination as I awaited, I think, what was to be a root canal. So I'm not sure which one was less pleasant, thinking about my golf game or the root canal itself. <clears throat> so I'm going through, I'm thinking posture. I don't even know if I've ever thought about posture. What am I supposed to think about posture? What is my posture? How do I do that? How do I grip the club? What, what am I doing wrong? And, and, and how am I approaching aiming? What, what am I doing and how can I, how can I fix it? So I'm using this article and I'm working through each area in my mind and the next time I was on the driving range I thought about these and I sought to put what they had said into practice and I at least got to the point that I didn't want to quit anymore. But what we have in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Beatitudes in particular is a kind of getting back to the basics from Jesus, back to the basics of what it means to follow him, of what it means to be a Christian, of what it means to be part of his kingdom, of what it means to be blessed, to have your soul flourish no matter what the circumstances of life actually are. So you see, you can't just read the Beatitudes. It's not just lovely, it's not just poetic. It's not just something to read and to appreciate the beauty of them and to think that they're nice and to maybe even agree with some of them and then move on. Now these, in addition, in addition to describing the Christian life, these are meant to test us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13 that we are to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith, to test ourselves. And, and the Beatitudes are actually a helpful way to do that. So you just think about the ones that we've looked at thus far. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Am I convinced that I'm broke, that I'm needy, that I'm empty, that I have nothing to contribute to my own salvation before God? Am I convinced of that? Blessed are those who mourn. How, how, do, I, how do I respond to my sin? How often am I laughing at sin? How, how often am I minimizing sin or dismissing sin or blaming others for my sin? Does, my, does sin actually break my heart? Blessed are the meek. What's my attitude toward others? Am I genuinely humble? Do I consider the interests of others and not just what I want? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Where do I find satisfaction? What do I want to accomplish today? Do I actually long to live a life that's right before God? 
Blessed are the merciful. How do I respond to those who are in need, to those who are suffering physically, to those who are suffering spiritually? How do I respond? Do I, do I like that priest and that Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan, do I just go over to the other side of the road and I look over and I'm like, well, that's really terrible for them, but I've got things to do? Do I sacrifice for the sake of mercy? You see, these are the kinds of things we ought to be asking ourselves, aren't they? And the self-examination just continues today as we hear this astounding statement by Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the kind of statement that you don't just study. It studies you. It opens up the pages of your life and of my life. So let's think about this. Let's let it study us this morning. First, let's think about a pure heart. The heart is a key concept in the Bible. It's it's not a reference to the muscle that pumps blood. It's not uh, like so many today would say it is. It's not just the great producer of emotions. Um, in, in the Bible, when the Bible speaks of the heart, it's speaking about the center of who we are, the, the control center. Our heart is the source of our thinking and our words and our actions. Now, all of our sons, all of our sons have enjoyed these first-person uh, video games. You know what I'm saying? Where you're like a person and you're going around doing particular things, uh, uh, particularly ones that involve weapons. So, I... I have tried these, and I am terrible at them, all right? You give me a sports game, I can figure that out. But there are like 700 buttons on this controller and at least six different joysticks, and different combinations do different things, and I'm hopeless. So if they want a quick win, they'll play these things against me because I'm terrible at them. Um, But this much I know, whatever it is I do with that controller... That's what the guy on the screen's going to do. If I push the button to jump, the guy's going to jump. If I don't know what I'm doing, whatever it is I didn't know I was doing, he's going to do. If I set down the controller and leave, the guy's not supposed to do anything except probably die at the hands of his enemies. And here's the thing the Bible says that that controller is like the heart. We don't speak and act apart from the involvement of the heart. You ever said something and then you said something like this? Oh, I didn't mean to say that. (laughs) Well, maybe you didn't want to say it. But it's not that your tongue just was on automatic pilot as if it became disconnected and had a mind of its own there for a second. Jesus says in Matthew 15, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Now, if you take a close look at that list, you know what you'll find? You'll find thoughts, you'll find words, and you'll find actions. That means, dear friends, that evil thoughts about others don't originate with their words and actions. They originate in the heart. Lustful thoughts do not, are not thrust upon us by an image in front of us or by what somebody else is wearing. Lust comes from the heart. Slandering our spouse when we're having coffee with a friend didn't come from our spouse's faults or shortcomings or sin. It came from our heart. Stealing from the company, whether it's time or whether it's uh, money or whether it's office supplies, 
doesn't originate with the fact that this company mistreats its employees and they need to get it. It originates in the heart. When I first started contemplating that, friends, that is when the Lord helped me to understand the depth of my own depravity. I could have opened a theological textbook and told you all about depravity. All about how awful we are, how hopeless we are, how we can't do anything to improve our own situation. But then when God opened the door on a text like that, it was like God took all of that information and said, that is you, Bubba. He didn't say Bubba. (laughs) He knows my name. But you really think about that, meditate on that, and that will give you a sense not just of how depraved your actions are or your words are or your thoughts are. It takes away all blame shifting, doesn't it? It takes away blaming it on another person, blaming it on a bad day, blaming it on my sickness, blaming it on all these other things. Because when I say, oh, I didn't mean to say that, Jesus says... Yes, you did. It may be a reflex, but it's a reflex that comes from a heart and its disposition toward my life. The heart is at the center of life, and that is why Solomon pressed on his sons. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. The heart is at the center. So what about purity? What are we to think about purity? Well, Let me give you two words that help to think about what it is that we're getting at with the the notion of purity. Spotless and singular. Spotless, to be pure, is to be spotless. No dirt, no filth, unsoiled, unpolluted, pristine, stain-free, clean. Now, as we all know, there's clean... And then there's clean. So when a child goes to clean her room, there are two possible definitions of clean, right? There is the child's definition of clean, and then there is mom's definition of clean. And essentially, the child's definition of clean is this, cleaner. Cleaner than it was just a few minutes ago. Isn't that right, April? That's right. (laughs) Right? You know, things shoved maybe under the bed, a few things put away, trash neatly stacked so that it looks like less trash. Six inches from the trash can. But that's just cleaner. But then mom walks in and says, now wait a second, this is not clean. There's mom's definition of clean, where dirty clothes actually get to the laundry, where clean clothes actually get to the drawer or the hanger or wherever they go in that room, where trash is not neatly stacked, but is thrown away, where the floor is vacuumed or swept, or mopped, or whatever the case may be. It's actually clean. And quite frankly, it could use deodorizing. That will help. It should smell clean when you're done. And I think sometimes we tend to take the idea of purity the way a child takes the idea of clean. As a relative purity. I just want to be 
purer than others. I mean, there may be hidden stains, but they are nice and neatly tucked away. And I'm definitely cleaner than that guy, at least cleaner on the surface, cleaner in the eyes of people. But God's definition is not purer, it's pure. It is stain-free. It is pristine. It is clean all the way to the heart. But not only is purity about being spotless, it's about being singular. So purity has the idea of being unmixed. So, when, you know, you clean with maybe pure alcohol. You put that on something. There, it's, it's unmixed. There's nothing else in there except the alcohol. And with purity, there's nothing else, there's nothing else tainting this one single-minded devotion. You know, Matthew 6, later on, we'll see Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You see, the trails of pursuing God and pursuing money run in opposite directions. They go different ways. You can't do both. You just can't do it. You can't have a divided mind. You have to be singular, a pure devotion to the Lord. So this is why Jesus says in Matthew 22 that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Singularly. It is out of that that all of the right horizontal loves come. But I only love horizontally in the way that God wants me to. In, if I first love Him the way I ought to. I can't, be, I can't be right with God and loving with God and not loving with others and the other way around. Not in a way that pleases God. So to be pure is to be spotless and is to be singular. And blessed are the pure in heart. A stainless singular heart. Yes, that purity comes out in our words, it comes out in our actions, but it's not mere words and actions. It is at the very core of the being, our heart. Now that sounds pretty difficult, doesn't it? To be pure in heart? I know you would all be nodding right now if you weren't nodding off, but That sounds pretty difficult, doesn't it? Well, as Charlie Peacock once sang, cheer up, church. You're worse off than you think. Because it's not difficult. It's impossible to actually be pure in heart. But, There's good news. With man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so you see the pure heart is is at the heart. Oh, losing my uh, microphone here. The pure heart is at the heart of God's work of redemption. It is at the heart of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So just think about the story of redemption with the purity of heart in mind, beginning with the fact that our hearts are not pure. From the moment that Adam and Eve fell, our hearts as as humanity have been impure so that in Genesis 6 before God sends the flood what does he what do we know the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually (laughs) there is no wiggle room in that 
Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, you say, well, that was back then. That's not true now, is it? We've come so far. You don't even have to look to the world to find that, do you? You need only look to the mirror to see a heart that goes wrong. This is the condition of man. Only evil continually. It doesn't mean that that evil expresses itself in fullness in every single person at every single moment. It means that's all that there is. The mindset on the flesh doesn't please God. Indeed, it cannot. It cannot. So that the diagnosis of Jeremiah 17 is is one we should agree with. The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Because do you know what you'll seek to convince yourself of? You'll seek to convince yourself that all the only evil continually, that's all those other people. I know those people. They sit on that side of the political aisle. I know them. I know them really well. They're those people. When in fact, friends, they is us. There is no us in them when it comes to the pure and the impure. There is just us. This is the natural condition of mankind. Impure, filthy, dirty, unclean, stained. The next thing in the story, though, is that nothing impure will ever enter heaven. We read this this morning in Psalm 24. Who shall enter, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. I know how many of you are ready to say, that's me. That's me. I've got clean hands and a pure heart. None of us. But that's the only way to stand there. In fact, when you get to the end of the Bible, in Revelation, as John is describing uh, the new Jerusalem where God's people will dwell forever, he writes, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing unclean will ever enter it. It's getting worse and worse, isn't it? We are not clean. And nothing unclean ever enters heaven. But it actually gets a little worse before it gets better. Because God's primary interest is the heart. God is primarily interested in the heart. That's important to know because the solution to our impurity is not merely to put on some external things. Like, let's let's get going on the religious rituals here. Let's have extra church services. I mean, nobody's clamoring for that, but, you know, in theory. Let's have extra church services. Let's do some extra rituals. Let's let's go through all these motions. Let's do that. Let's do whatever it takes. Let's turn over a new leaf. But God is not interested in our leaves. He's interested in our roots. This is why, as God is condemning Israel in Isaiah chapter 29, He he says this is part of the reason He's going to act against them. This people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. Now you stop after that first part. This people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips. That sounds great. I want to go to that church. That sounds good. But their heart is far from me. 
They talk a fantastic game. But their heart's not in it. And you would think that when God sends them into exile and all of these terrible things happen to God's people, that things would get better. But when you, you, you notice that when Jesus is speaking about these same Jews in the Gospels, particularly their leaders, we find the same problem. So in Matthew 26, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. You see, honoring God with our lips, appearing to be clean, it's just not good enough. It doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't get all the way to the heart. In fact, there are times in the Old Testament when God essentially says to his people, um, could you just shut down the sacrifices? Because all this is useless the way you're doing it. Wouldn't that be something? But God, you went to all that trouble. Do you remember Leviticus, Lord? Do you remember what you've told us to do? And God says, I'm thinking particularly of Isaiah chapter 1. He says, just stop. Stop with the festivals. Stop with the sacrifices. Stop it. Come and let's reason together. Your sins are like scarlet. God is interested in the heart. He's not interested in what we might do for him. Or just do. Because, let me ask you a serious question. Do you believe that you can do right things with a wrong heart? That's a yes, no question. Do you believe that you can put on the show and do the right thing? Do you believe that you could come here, which God calls us to do? Do you believe you could come here, which is a right thing to do? And do you think you could come with the wrong heart? Yeah. Do you think you could climb up into this baptistry and be baptized with the wrong heart? That's a yes, no question. Yeah. Do you think that you could seek to make an argument for morality in your workplace with a wrong heart? Do you think you could teach a Bible study with a wrong heart? You think you could preach a sermon with a wrong heart? You think you can attend a prayer meeting with a wrong heart? You see, the list just goes on and on. God sees and is concerned for the heart. Now, some draw the wrong implication thinking that because God only sees the heart and only is primarily concerned for the heart that what we do doesn't matter. Whether we serve doesn't matter. Whether we do go to the prayer meeting doesn't matter. Whether I do teach a Bible study doesn't matter. Whether I do seek to make a case for this or that at work doesn't matter. That's not the case at all. It's that we can do the right things with the wrong heart. Why? Because the heart that wants to look right the heart that wants to win the argument, the heart that wants to look spiritual at church. These are impure. I told you it would get worse before it got better. So what is the solution? I mean, if we're, if we're not pure, if we can't get into heaven as we are, and if we can't actually do anything to improve this condition, what, in, what are we going to do? Well, nothing. The good news is that God has done something. God sent Jesus to purify us. Titus chapter 2 speaks of our God, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Do you see that? 
Jesus came not only to redeem us, but to purify. Ephesians 1.4 tells us that we were chosen in Him before the creation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before Him. Ephesians 5, when, when Paul tells husbands to love their wives, he says, as Christ loved the church because Christ gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her. Jesus purified us by becoming filthy in our place. He bore our sin and our guilt and our filth on the cross, and the blood He shed there made us clean. Our souls had deep and dark and permanent stains, and only the blood of Jesus washes us whiter than snow. Guilty, vile, and helpless we Spotless Lamb of God was He. Full atonement. Can it be? Hallelujah. What a Savior. And when we trust in Christ, our sins are washed away and Christ's absolute purity is credited to us. We are, in, in God's sight, we are pure in heart. I wonder if you are pure in heart like that through faith in Jesus. Whatever it is that has stained your soul, whatever it is that makes you unclean, there's no stain so deep the blood of Jesus cannot wash it. Turn to Him in faith. But you see, the pure heart isn't just about a status we have through faith in Jesus. It's not just a position, it's actually a practice. It's something that, it's a way we ought to live. 1 John 3 says, Everyone who thus hopes in Christ purifies himself as he is pure. In other words, being pure in God's sight, we thus make it our aim to pursue and seek and live pure lives. How do we do that? Well, let me just give you a few things. Very quickly. You want to pursue purity? Obey God's Word. Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young man keep himself pure? Keep his way pure. By guarding it according to your Word. That guarding is not just a keeping of doctrine. It is you guard your way. You can only guard the way by guarding the way, if you will. The Word has to determine the way. You have to, obedience is not optional in a life of purity. Not only do you have to be committed to obey God's Word, you must ask for God's help. We've already talked about how impotent we are to do this. Psalm 51, after the great sin that we all know David for, what does he ask the Lord to do? Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. You can't do it on your own. We have to have the Spirit's help. Third, we learn by example. Paul tells Timothy to set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. God's design is that there be examples of purity that we follow. We see those not only in our lives, we also see some of them in the church history, in the biographies that we read. Purity, spotless and single, single-minded folks whose one desire is to please the Lord. They have no other thought to them. Now, just as a side note... 
if you're entrusted with authority over others at all, in work, in your home, you are an example. You know, it's sometimes funny, we, 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 we might pull aside one of our older children and tell them how they need to be an example for the others, right? You need to be an example. Well, that's not really fair because they may or may not want to be an example. It might be better to say, you are an example to your brothers and sisters. What kind of example are you? Parents, you don't need to be an example for your children. Just know that you are. If they were to follow in your footsteps, would they be footsteps of purity? Would they be footsteps of single-minded devotion to God? Of hating sin and wanting to, to not even touch it, go near it. And then we learn by instruction. Paul tells Titus that when he has, sets these churches in order on Crete, that older women are to train younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind. So one of the things that we need instruction about is how to be pure. How is it that I arrange my life so that I am single-minded in my devotion to God? How is it that I can do these things? Because it feels like I need to do a thousand other things. Well, we need instruction. And I think we would all amen that, but somewhere along the lines, the idea that this should actually be practiced and not just taught about seems to have gone out the window. So we who are older should not be it's not prideful to teach those who are younger. It's our responsibility. And if you're younger, it's, it's, it's not weakness to seek out those who are older than you who could teach you. It's, it's actually God's design. That's how God wants us to operate. So those are just some, some ideas for how we can pursue a pure heart. Obey God's word. Ask for help. Learn by example. Learn by instruction. But this idea of pursuing purity is so important that the writer of the Hebrews says that we are to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see God. Sounds almost like he was reading from Jesus' notes, doesn't it? Well, that brings us to the second thing. And let me assure you, the second point will not nearly be as long as the first. As we think about seeing God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, God tells Moses in Exodus 33 that no man shall see his face and live. Sinful human beings cannot last a second in God's presence. He cannot tolerate sin even for a moment. But Jesus has made a way through his death to cleanse us, to make us pure, so that we shall see God. We will see God in this life, and we will see God after this life. Now, in this life, we see God with eyes of faith. We see God everywhere. We see God in creation, don't we? In thunderstorms and mountains and snowflakes and blooming trees and animal life and sunsets and rainbows, they all declare His glory. And we say, Amen to that. We see God in providence. We look back over our lives and we see how He's brought us to where we are, how we would, we would never know Him the way we know Him. We would never be doing what we're doing. There are so many things, the way He saved us, the way He protected us, the way He provided for us. All of these things, we see God in providence. We also, we also see God in humanity. Now, I don't mean to say that we see all human, human beings as little gods. That is heresy. What I mean to say is that when we look at God, when we look at human beings, we see the image of God. We see the marks of God on human beings. We see the skill and wisdom of doctors. Right before I had surgery, whatever it was, 10 days ago, uh, I don't know if I was loopy yet. I don't think I was. 
But my, the, my doctor came in, and she, she's telling me what she's going to do, as if I'll remember. And then she says, is there anything else you need? And I said, yes, I need to pray for you. And so I prayed for her before she did my surgery. It wasn't long. It wasn't anything I wrote down. It's not going to be published in anything. But one of the things I thank God for was her skill and wi- for giving her skill and wisdom to repair a foot like mine. It's the image of God. It's God. It's God who has instilled that in her. We see it in the care of nurses and teachers. We, we, we see God in the creativity of artists and writers. We see God in the orderliness of engineers and mathematicians. We, we see God in the justice of law. We, we see reflections of God. Yes, sometimes those things are sin twists and mars and it's incomplete, but we see... Sometimes it looks like a reflection in a funhouse mirror, but we still see the image of God. We see it all around us. And then we see God in our suffering. We see that God is powerful and, and good and wise and that He ordains the timing and the depth and even the manifestation of the suffering that I'm enduring for His glory and for my good. Friends, it is only a single-minded devotion to God that will see God in suffering. At least see Him for who He really is. Some people see God as capricious and cruel in suffering. But that is not how a pure heart sees God. Now, of course, even in our best days, we don't see the fullness of God, do we? 1 Corinthians 13 says we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And that brings us to the last thing. We will see, we will see God at the end of this life. Not just in this life through eyes of faith, but at the end of this life. One day when this life is over, those who have trusted in Jesus, who have followed Him, the pure in heart, will see God. God will dwell with His people and we will dwell with Him. And Revelation 22 says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face. What will that be like, you ask? I have no idea. But here's what I do know. There's nowhere else we'd rather be than there. Face to face with our Creator, our Savior, our King, folded into His loving embrace with His hand wiping away every tear, wiping away mourning, wiping away pain, wiping away even death itself. And friends, it is only those who are pure in heart, only those who know God on that day will see Him, not those who know of Him or know about Him, not those who just know a bunch of the Bible even though they don't care about the Bible, not those who acknowledge His existence but claim and claim generic belief, not those who go through the mere motions of religious ritual, no, only those who know Him as Father and friend, who know Him personally through faith in Jesus, who know Him as the God who cleansed them, who washed them, who made them pure in heart, only they will see God. Do you know Him that way? It'll be quite a day. The pure in heart with pure joy, seeing God and seeing Him embraced by Him forever. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. Our Father, we know the depths of our own impurity, which gives us great awe for Your grace and mercy toward us. 
And we ask you, Lord, to help us as those who have been made pure in heart through faith in Jesus to live pure in heart, to obey your word, to depend on you in prayer, to, to learn from examples around us, to learn from the instruction of others and the instruction of your word. Oh God, we want to be pure. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity and change us for Jesus' sake. We thank you for the promise that those who are pure in heart will see you not only in this life through eyes of faith but at the end face to face. We praise and glorify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, uh, we are going to